Okay, welcome everyone. So Collections Care and Conservation Alliance is a network of professionals supporting the care and conservation of cultural heritage collections and materials. We provide information and education to individuals and organizations caring for art, artifacts, historical records, and other collections, including cultural institutions, artists, private collectors, and municipalities. So we, um, our goal is to support the network of conservation and preservation professionals. Uh, we are a membership organization, and in a moment, I'll be dropping the information, uh, the link to not only our main website page, but also to our membership page. Um, and we welcome you to consider joining our organization um, after today's session, if you're not a member already. So presenting Caring for Books today is Deborah Howe, who is a collections conservator at Dartmouth. And Deborah is a member of our organization uh, in the professional affiliate category. So Deborah, please take it away. Great. Let me, let me get my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, let me get my, I'm still getting my viewing in order here. All right, I might just minimize this. Uh, one, okay, I can just see, okay. I'm just gonna go with this screen. Well, welcome everybody and thank you so much for coming. Um, as Erica said, my day job is the collections conservator at Dartmouth College. And I head up the conservation lab where we work on general collection material as well as special collections. And later on in the talk, I'll address a little bit of what we do here in the lab. But just to start off, I wanna thank you so much for coming to my presentation today. I want to thank the board of the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance for asking me to come and talk to you about caring for books and other facts and tips on paper-based collections. My talk will cover some very basic concepts, which you may already know, but hopefully somewhere in the talk, there will be some new information and takeaways. Also, as a disclaimer, I have used some product placement in the presentation, but by no means is it necessarily an endorsement. And also, this is the first time I'm presenting via a Zoom webinar, so please have patience. Some of the topics I'd like to look at today are external and internal factors influencing the condition of your collections. I'll consider some solutions to common problems, look at some exhibit tips, explore disaster preparation, and think about collection priorities and storage. First, I wanna talk about the environment and external impact. I saw this image on Facebook the other day and I just really loved it as it encapsulated what I think many addicts look like, full of books. Also in this photograph, there's a military garment in the background, and I think a photo hanging on the wall. There's a lot of items that should not be stored here for sure. So as many of us know, books do not like to be in fluctuating environment, which of course attics and basements are exactly those places. Books and paper-based collections are most happy at temperatures below 72 degrees Fahrenheit with a relative humidity near 50%. So looking at extreme conditions, we have our hot and dry and our hot and humid. Both of these can have a daunting impact on our collections. And of course, the effects of sun and light can cause irreversible damage such as you can see here on this book, which was at the end of a shelf where the book end has remained darker than the light faded cloth. And of course, there are many different types of instruments we use to measure the environment. Here you can see an old school hydrothermograph, which some of you may still use and which I still see in museums every once in a while. There's a UV monitor, which measures the levels of light and UV and a data logger, which will measure your temperature and humidity levels. Sometimes the specialty equipment can be quite expensive, but you can find very good basic instruments online, such as this Cole Palmer humidity and temperature indicator. 
One fantastic resource, which, which I use quite a lot, is the eClimate notebook software. This was recreated by the Image Permanent Institute in Rochester, New York, with the aid of a Mellon grant. It was an effort to help collecting institutions better manage their environments. IPI developed preservation matrix, and these matrix have become the cornerstone of their approach to sustainable preservation practices. All basic information provided on this website is free and accessible to the public. So this is their main homepage. There's a nice section on fundamentals that gives you lots of information about storage climates, time weighted index, and what a preservation matrix is. There are lots and lots of video resources. But if you want to upload data and be able to create graphs like this, you do have to buy a subscription. And there's also lots of resources on their website for facilities managers. Having a good rapport with yours is a key factor of maintaining your environment to identify possibilities to improve conditions for long-term collection preservation and to help address problem areas. So going back to our different types of environments, the one that has a very high impact on our collections is hot and humid. We especially see the effects of this in some of the southern states, as well as here in New England. It's pretty notable how often I smell musty basins and houses. This is a photo from Duke's preservation blog called Preservation Underground, which is one of my favorite websites to go to for information. We can really see how mold has attacked these books, but also how they are properly wrapped in wax paper and are put into a freezer. Do not seal a moldy book inside a plastic bag if it will not be frozen. This will create a microclimate that will encourage mold growth. If you come across mold in your collection, personal safety is the first thing at hand. Many people are very sensitive to mold spores and can become quite sick. Make sure you have proper outerwear and a good respirator. Always wear gloves when handling books that have a possibility of mold. If your problem is large, make sure you call the experts. However, if you just have a book that has a musty smell, but no signs of mold, or perhaps it's been living in a house with a smoker, there is something you can do about it. My first go-to solution is the simplest one. You can air out your book on a nice warm breezy day, just like you would air out your sheets. This will drastically help eliminate some of the odors in your book. If this is not an option for you, you can create a micro chamber. These photos were taken from a blog post from the Parks Library in Iowa. Using an odor eliminator, such as this specialty item pictured here, or you could just use kitty litter, find a large trash can and put the kitty litter at the bottom, then place a screen or a crate over the litter. Place your books on the tray or in the crate fanned out then place the lid over the trash can. This will create a sealed environment where the kitty litter will absorb the odor of the book. This may take up to one to two, maybe even three weeks. You could also use a large plastic bag if you don't have a trash can. The point is to create a tightly sealed environment. And of course, it's important to keep clean area, food-free environment as this will deter bugs. As you can see here, insects can cause a lot of damage. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see the cover of this book has been eaten by cockroaches. And clearly the one on the lower right-hand side has serious damage. The most experience I've had with pests has been with silverfish. They like damp areas and they feed on paper, starch, cotton silk, and sometimes synthetic fibers. So if you find a small infestation of silverfish, Make sure you look around and find where the source of moisture is coming from and fix it. And here we see the external impact of someone misshelving books. Books that are oversized and cannot fit upright on the shelf should be placed spine downwards to inhibit sagging joints. And here we see the also a large amount of books that are stacked, which can lead to instability and items could fall and become damaged. So far, we have looked at external impact. 
on our collections, forces coming in from the outside that have harmful effect on our unique items. Now I'm going to look at internal impact. One very interesting project is the Winterthur Poison Book Project. This is an ongoing investigation to explore the materials of Victorian era publishers binding. The focus is on the identification of potentially toxic pigments used in book cloth. Tests have indicated that emerald green book cloth colorant is extremely friable and offsets a detectable amount of arsenic. Emerald green publishers binding present a health risk to librarians, booksellers, collectors, and researchers, and should be identified, handled, and stored with caution. For more information, please visit their website. Another internal problem is one of the main misfortunes of the 20th century. This is the realization that many of our books were disintegrating from within. Brittle paper became one of the main focuses of conservation concerns. In brittle paper, we have what is called inherent vice, where the method and material by which the paper is made causes it to self-destruct. Mechanical pulping of wood fiber produces paper with the shortest fiber length and does not remove lignin from the wood. This promotes acid hydrolysis, which causes the paper to become weak. Many newspapers are printed on mechanically pulped paper. And there's a very nice, nice write-up on this in the Library of Congress website. In an effort to deal with this massive problem, the Library of Congress worked with scientists and vendors to create a process to mass deacidify large collections of the books in 2001. This is a treatment that deposits an alkaline reserve into the paper. It does not make the paper stronger. Here you can see tanks full of the alkaline solution where the books are dipped in and agitated within these tanks. This is still done today, mostly in Eastern Europe countries and somewhere, sometimes in the US. Another solution for handling brittle and fragile paper is to encapsulate. Essentially, this is placing your item in between two sheets of inert polyester mylar. This is a great illustration from the University of Miami on how encapsulation can protect your brittle item. In the upper three photos, the person is holding a piece of paper, crumbles it up, and you can see the result is a pile of crumbs. In the second row of photos, the paper has been encapsulated, and after it is crumpled up, it remains intact. And in the bottom row of photos, you can see the before and after close-up shots of the results of crumbling a piece of paper with and without encapsulation. Because of the popularity and effectiveness of this treatment, you can now purchase pre-made encapsulated L sleeves. And I do recommend these often as they are a simple and cost-effective way to protect fragile materials. While encapsulation is an excellent solution for many documents, it is not a perfect solution for everything. The potential drawback to encapsulation is the characteristic electrostatic charge. Any document that contains friable media, such as charcoal, pastels, colored pencil, graphite, some paints and flanking ink should not be encapsulated. The electrostatic charge of the polyester can lift the media off the paper, thereby causing significant damage. It is best to use an acid-free folder for these types of items. So switching gears a little bit, so when you can't keep your original item or you don't wanna use it very often, then we often look at reformatting. This is essentially taking the original item and making it into something new. One example of this is transferring old brittle film onto a polyester base and storing it in a cold vault, while at the same time making a digital copy which can be used for access. In the early days of reformatting, microfilm was very popular. Newspapers were often formatted to microfilm, and if any of you have ever tried to read a newspaper on a microfilm machine, you know how challenging that can be. Here at Dartmouth Library, we keep one microfilm reader on hand, but I know they were becoming more obsolete as time moved forwards. Another type of reformatting is preservation photocopy, and this to me is the best option for keeping as true to the original as possible. This book was photocopied on acid-free paper leaving a large inner margin for the binding. And I believe this volume had colored plates, which would have been encapsulated and placed in the volume after it was photocopied. 
Then the collated pages were sent out to the commercial binder. The resulting product is a very satisfying object to hold and look at. And of course today, the main form of reformatting is to digitize. This makes the information very accessible, but potentially dubious for the very long term without proper preservation protocols. So now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about the hands-on conservation of material. The real turnaround in perspective for conservation was after the Florence flood in 1966. This event brought many restorers and binders together where they looked at what types of bindings worked and what didn't in the wake of this disaster. During the Florence flood, it was very common to at least minimally place a damaged book in a box. This was intended as phase one in the life of the book. There would be phase two, phase three, and maybe phase four where the book was to eventually be cleaned, repaired, and conserved. However, in many cases, the phase box became a permanent box. And to this day, we still use the term phase box, even though more often than not, this will be a permanent box for the book we put in it. Here is an example of acid-free phase box, as well as some pre-made acid-free document boxes. Often boxing is the simplest way to protect your book. There are other types of housing and enclosures, such as a four flap wrapper or a deluxe clamshell box. And one of my favorite items is a pocket binder. These are easy and simple to make. They consist of a pocket and a sleeve. Your fragile item goes into the sleeve as this provides protection to the item as it slides in and out of the pocket as all this dress then goes onto the sleeve. And then of course, there are special custom made enclosures such as this one for a collection of small matchboxes and this other clever, clever option for wrappers by creating a see-through spine using mylar so that the book inside, inside can still be seen. There's just, here's just a little snapshot of what we do here at Dartmouth College. We focus on the treatment needs of general collections, the art library, map collection, medical libraries, and mostly material from Special Collections Library. We're considered a hybrid lab because we do more than just special collections. This is an example of our basic general collection spine repair. It takes about 30, 20 to 30 minutes for each book. The cloth case spine is removed and the text box spine is cleaned and new liners are applied if needed. Then we fabricate a new spine, which you can see on the left-hand side, which is the black material on the table. Once the new spine is piece is attached to the book, we remount the original spine trying to keep as much material as possible. We also offer an online tutorial called a simple book repair manual. This was updated a few years ago and we have new videos and updated photos. This is a basic how to for general collections treatment. And it is also downloadable as a PDF. One of the sections in the simple book repair manual is about general cleaning. And this is one simple way to really keep your collections in sound condition. When vacuuming your books, you should always maintain pressure on the text block and move the vacuum head from the spine edge forward, never back and forth. This ensures that all the debris will go into the vacuum and not be pushed down into the folds of the book. If there is danger that parts of the book will be sucked into the vacuum cleaner, you can always place a small mesh over the head of the vacuum. Another method of cleaning, which you can use, is using a smoke sponge. This is an open weave sponge that is specifically designed to remove soot, but can also be used for simple cleaning. For a more delicate touch, people have also used cosmetic sponges. Some of the damages you may see in your collection are board attachments, which are very common. Here at the library, we are able to perform a simple board reattachment using the Japanese tissue. However, if you do not have this treatment available to you, you can always simply tie up your book to keep the boards with the text block, or you can place it in an acid-free box. If the box is too big, add filler material to make sure that the book does not slide around and cause further damage to itself. This is an example of a scrapbook where the pages were quite brittle with lots of mounted ephemera. 
and we were able to encapsulate some of the pages, remount some of the original pamphlets and information broadsides on new acid-free paper. Another popular item to be aware of, which is the magnetic photo album. This was very popular in the 1970s. And I have to say, if you have any of these laying around in your collections, or even at home, I would highly recommend removing the photos from these albums. The adhesive use is very acidic and cause yellowing to your photos, or the photos can become fused to the pages, making it difficult to remove them. If you find yourself stuck trying to move a photo, you can try this handy tip by taking some dental floss and moving it slowly back and forth underneath the photo to release it. So now I'm just going to talk about some thoughts on exhibits and book display and handling. And exhibits are fantastic as they provide a way to highlight our collections and to focus on a theme or topic. However, if items stay in an, an exhibit for too long, overexposure and position fatigue can cause damage to your books. To use to minimize the effects of light and overexposure, the use of a copy or facsimile is very popular. Using a high res scans and professional printers, it's amazing what good copies you can get. Using cradles and supports, both in exhibits and for consulting books, is very helpful to protect your items from over opening. Here is an example of a very fancy butterfly cradle from the company Benchmark, which gives a very professional look to, the, to your display. As an alternative, these supports were made here in the conservation lab using book cloth and book board. The wedges are adjustable using Velcro and can fold up inside the base. The same basic concept can, can be constructed from corrugated museum, corrugated or museum board as well. Another type of support is the book futon. These, there's an excellent step-by-step -step instructions on how to make these on Duke's preservation blog. Another large question that always comes up is whether to wear gloves or not to wear gloves when handling books. In the past, it was required that gloves were worn due to the concern that natural oils in the hands would transfer to the book. But over time, people realized that it made the handling of these items tricky, clumsy, and sometimes challenging. And in the end, sometimes caused more visible damage than simply just washing your hands and making sure they were dry before handling. So the current approach is not to wear gloves. However, when handling photographs in silver, gloves are recommended. So you try all these precautions and you're careful, but nevertheless, disaster can happen. For your collections, and you you know store them in acid-free boxes, and yet a flood or a rain can come in. To be prepared for a potential disaster, have a disaster plan. This is a thought-out document with key phone numbers of who to call, stakeholders whose collections are affected, noted areas where recovery supplies are stored, and resources to go for help. There are many online resources and centers where information and creating plans can be just for you. Even having just a large roll of plastic that can be used to cover books in the event of a leaky pipe is helpful. Here at the library, we're able to have workshops on disaster recovery. This helps staff become familiar with the feeling of books that are wet and dirty and experience on how to pack them for recovery. If there is a disaster recovery workshop near you, I would highly recommend taking it. And I know that CCCA has promoted such opportunities. Another good assignment is to know where your fire extinguishers are, the one located nearest you and alternative ones in your area. And of course, be comfortable and familiar with how to use a fire extinguisher. I keep the key phrase pass in my mind, which helps me to remember the steps. Pull the pen, aim to the base of the fire, squeeze the handle, and sweep back and forth. But of course, if the fire is large and out of hand, please remove yourself from danger. Another form of disaster comes with collapsed shelving. This happened while I was at Northwestern in the lower level storage area and caused a lot of physical damage to books in the form of bent covers and torn pages. Periodically, check your shelving and bookcases for stability. 
So you have your collections and you've got all these precautions and you're taking care of them, but it's always good to step back and prioritize your collections. In the long run, it will save you money and resources. And this also goes for your home collections. Decide what to save, what is really valuable to you. Do you have family heirlooms you can't replace? Family Bibles with writing in them or old photo albums? These are your special materials that need special attention. Then secondly, you have your favorite books, the ones you wanna keep around you. These books need a cool, dry place out of the sun. Perhaps these are books can, that can be displayed in a historic house. Create a dedicated space that's good for them. And for the rest of the items, pass them along or pack them away. This process will allow you to focus on what is most important and to allocate resources to those highly unique items. If you do decide to pack up your books, do, pack, do you pack in plastic or cardboard? Cardboard boxes allow books to breathe, but don't protect against moisture. Plastic containers may be good in a flood, but moisture can get trapped inside and, and books can get moldy. So ideally packing boxes in a cardboard is better, but with this in mind, boxes should always be stored off the floor. So by pulling this presentation together, I really discovered so many really awesome online resources. And in essence, I'd almost recommend people to sit down a dedicated hour or so and really do um, some online searching. This was a website I came across, Archival Methods. It had some excellent resources on photo care, photo housing. Uh, this was a blog I mentioned during the talk, which is the Preservation Underground by Duke Libraries, which has always got really useful, helpful information. The Preservation Lab blog, which is a, a group effort by the University of Cincinnati and the Cincinnati Public Library, also has a lot of great information. And this was another um, site I found, which is the Preservation Self-Assessment Program. And again, just a lot of really great definitions and resources um, on all types of material. I felt I found that really resourceful. This is a list of a lot of the places I've mentioned in my talk. That. And with that, I just want to thank you so much. I think I try to cover a lot of things just condensed down. So um, I'm happy to address any questions that anyone may have. Deborah, thank you so much. Um, it's so uh, wonderful to have your presentation and to have you here to answer questions. I want to, um, because we're a smaller group, I want to um, open the floor um, and uh, perhaps we could start with a question that Martha just posted in the chat about uh, bookends. Oh, just the use of bookends? Martha says, can you address bookends, bookends in museum storage? Sure. Um, the, there are, I think there, yeah, there are different types of bookends. For museum storage as museum for, for books, I guess. Let me see if I can get to full screen here. Um, you know, you want a bookend that's going to be a really firmly um, uh, held in place, either with a long base on it. Um, I know there are some bookends that clip on to the bookshelf that are adjustable. And I, I think I, I'm not sure what the question is like. You know, certainly you want to use bookends if you need them. I'm switching my screen here. I don't think I really answered that question. <clears throat> Excuse me. But yes, I would highly recommend the use of bookends in museums if you need them. Um, so Martha, um, please feel free to, to follow up your question in the chat if you want to unmute yourself or uh, post some any more detail in the chat. Oh, let's see, she was probably speaking as I was, or typing as I was speaking. 
Martha says acrylic, cardboard, or metal bookends when books are stored upright. Yeah, there are metal bookends should be fine, acrylic bookends. Um, I think in my experience, I would lean towards metal bookends. Um, you know, I'm taking for granted that the conditions in a museum are appropriate, whereby the metal would not become corrosive. Most bookends are coated. Um, Yeah, I, <laughs> I think um, I don't have much more to say about the bookend, sorry. <laughs> well, we have a, another guest who wants to take the, the conversation in a different direction. So uh, I'll pose that question for them. This is DBW who says, a collection specific question, matchbooks, should they be stored as a whole or just the covers? And are there any concerns about matchbooks? And by that, I, I, I think that this person means, are there any, do you have any pointers specifically for, for matchbooks, for caring for matchbooks? That's actually a really timely um, question because um, uh, there, Roger Williams is a conservator at Northwestern University. And he just, they also have a great blog and he just posted a very extensive kind of little mini research paper on the storage of mat match books for the, the, the reason of the fear of them catching on fire. And so he did a lot of test testing of dipping the tips of the matches in different solutions to essentially coat them. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think he used like a matte medium, a clear acrylic matte medium that would coat the, the tips of the matches to protect them from igniting. So yeah, if you have concerns that that would happen, I, I would direct you to Northwestern Roger Williams matchbook um, research. Yeah, I guess the matchbooks displayed in that enclosure, yeah, we did not treat in any way. Um, but it makes me think that I should go back and, and relook at those. <laughs> you know, in the event that we would have a fire in the stacks and it got close to the matches, yes, they, they could actually then just kind of uh, do a little bit more damage than necessary. All right, so I wanna invite uh, people who are, have joined us today to, um, to please unmute yourself and pose questions directly to Deborah. So please go ahead and chime in. Hi, Deborah, thank you. Um, question about those really neat looking um, mylar spine enclosures that you made um they're well, full disclaimer for a uh, full disclaimer i did not make those <laughs> whoever <laughs> had the brilliant idea yeah it is i mean they are great looking um are that those are part of your collection or they were a sample from someone else that was a sample from someone else i've always wanted to implement that um here at the college but to be honest we do not make a lot of wrappers a lot of colleges have just a standard practice of um, putting new, uh, especially rare book acquisitions automatically in a wrapper. And so what can happen is, of course, you know, if you have everything in a wrapper with a label, you just really can't see the spines of the book. So actually that, um, that technique of using the see-through mylar spine um, sort of came into being, I'd say quite, quite a few years ago. And um, it's, uh, it's a really satisfying solution, at least visually to your collections. The other uh, thing I've seen done is if you end up making a lot of phase boxes, you can Xerox the spine of your book 
print it out and then adhere that to the outside of the phase box. Mm -hmm. So at least then you have a visual image of what the book looks like. The nice thing about the Mylar is um, you can quickly see if the book is missing or not. <laughs> because a lot of times, you know, you have the enclosures on the shelf and uh, I have heard where people have gone back, they open it up and the book's not there. Oh, gosh, thank you. I've heard, can you hear me? Uh -huh. I've heard, uh, I've heard different advice about how to pack books in, in, in big cardboard boxes. Uh, someone told me they should be spined down, but other people sort of lie them on their sides. What's the best way if you have like 10 or 20 box books to go in a box? Yeah, I, for Pat, when you're packing for a like if we were packing for a disaster recovery exercise and they go in those crates, you saw in the, the photo where we're packing in those crates, yes, spine absolutely goes down. Each book gets wrapped in wax paper. They're packed very tightly. Um, ideally, if you were packing them for yourself, for your home use, um, yeah, I personally would just stack books of try to keep books of light size, like size together. Um, certainly fill in the, the empty areas so that they don't jostle around. Um, you know, that way, if you're like for if you're moving or, you know, you're just storing some books for your own personal collections. Yeah, I kind of, I tend to stack them in a stack, but again, tightly try to keep books of same size together. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jean Boardman. I have a small inn in Vermont, uh, but what I am concerned about is that um, my husband and I have a large collection of books, which we personally just prefer to have them out on the shelf in the living room for people to access mm -hmm. rather than worrying about conserving them for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And what I'm concerned about uh, at the moment is I have a, a lot of these are uh, limited edition or heritage club books uh, collected in the 50s and 60s and the bindings from people pulling them off the shelf. What for um, amateur repair or stabilization can one do about the bindings on these books? I don't know what the materials are that they use for the boards and the binding. Um, is it a kind of tape? I mean, some of them, Harry has just put, you know, whatever tape he had on it, which is not really appropriate. Uh, correct. You are correct. Um, yeah, tape is is not a really great solution. Um, we even get books down here in the library where patrons have decided to repair their own books. Mm -hmm. um, but for something like that, you know, you could um, through I don't know if you're familiar with Gaylord. It's a library supply company. No, and they have an I... archive. They have an archival. Um, section, so Gaylord Archival. I mean, you could essentially um, get some pre-cut sheets of mylar and wrap the mylar around the, the covers. And that uh, way, it around kind of, it could be like a dust jacket. Like a dust jacket. It'd be a see-through dust jacket. It would protect it. It would kind of hold the, the spine yeah. in place. Of course, all these books originally came in slip covers, which Harry just tossed when he was trying to get more on the shelf. <laughs> yeah, those are kind of, those are nice to have. Yes. So, but my, mylar cover, um, material yeah, that could, I can Like a mylar dust jacket. And make a dust jacket out of them, okay. Yeah. I also have a, a couple of, of um, leather, at least binding on a like one of them is a history of darkest Africa or something that uh, be completely 
the the boards and the binding have completely come off of the book. And I don't know the best way to say yeah, that. Yeah, I think, yeah, that is, it sounds is like it, it's got, it's gotten to volumes, the point, right. Yeah. You, it sounds like it's gotten to the point where you might take it to somebody like a conservator to have them look at it, or essentially like they had in the one slide, um, you know, get some um, string or if you've got some uh, like ribbon and just tie the book together and put the boards in place. At least that will keep it together until you're ready to uh, have somebody look at it for repair. Okay, yeah, this one's um, a 19, an 1890, you know, original print. Uh, wow. And, and so I, you know, obviously being on the shelf and being handled by people, it's deteriorated and dried because we don't have, you know, humidity controlled conservation issues in the building. Right, right. Just yeah, because. or yeah, or you know, if you have a small box, I would also recommend maybe that people don't use it anymore if you want to keep keep a hold of it. Yeah, that's it's always that fine balance between the value of the item to you and its condition, right. and if you want to, if it's worth it to fix it or not. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. I just I I assume it would be fairly expensive to fix, but I also you know, had hoped that it would still be available or eventually if my sons don't want these particular volumes that they'd be in um, saleable or condition, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I have a, a question uh, from Vermont. Um, I am curator of a little collection called the Russell Vermontiana Collection. And we have a lot of um, early journals and ledgers from say 1757 through um, 1890. Uh, the question is, do you store those upright or is it better to store them flat at this point? Yeah, if you've got them on shelves and they're they're shelved tightly, yep. um, I think standing upright on a shelf, okay. um, you know, because they're they're big and heavy books, and a lot of times that text block starts to sag out of the binding. Yeah. Um, you no, know, if if you want to keep them on display, you know, upright, you know, one thing you can do is to help support the book which is, um, I mean, you, you could just cut um, out of ideally an acid-free cardboard, yeah. you know, just a little strip that is the width of the text block and slide it underneath so that okay. it holds the text block up as the boards are sitting on the shelf. And so That's it's a like, a, it's, I mean, and they make actually what's called a book support. Um, which which does that for books that's a little bit more elaborate, but just for a quick fix, just by give, putting something underneath that text block to help hold it up will actually help quite a lot, especially if they're not being used that much. Right. Um, it would probably take you, you know, maybe an, an afternoon to cut all the little pieces and, and put them in there. Well, there are 200 some of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe, more, afternoon and maybe more than morning. an afternoon. Um, because yeah. Essentially, when we put books on display and exhibits, we'll do yeah. that. You know, because if the book is stand, if the book is standing upright, there will be like a, some kind of material that's the thickness okay. of the squares, to, so that you don't get what's called um, like text block text block drag, where it's like coming out of its shoulders. Okay. It's a good idea. Thanks. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Sounds like a great collection. It is. <laughs> so we we have a, a question that just got posted in the chat, which I think is a good follow up to this to Bill's question. 
Is there a general exhibit rule of thumb for when physician fatigue strikes oh. entirely specific to the book? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't have a time like answer for that. Um, and some of it would, would depend on the type of book. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, books that are open. I mean, you, you may have noticed this yourself. I mean, books that are open to a certain page for a long period of time and you close it, a lot of times when you open it again, it may defer to that set that that section or that opening. Um, for books on exhibit, um, yeah. You know, if it was up for a month to two months, um, it could start to show signs of being referred to that opening. You know, if, if you have a book that you're actually wanting to display different sections of the book, you could turn the pages every so often. I know here at the library, we have the Audubon Birds of America book. So it all, for, for purposes of just displaying more visuals, that those pages get turned. I think it's it might be every other week, perhaps, so that the book's not laying open at the same point for a long period of time. I mean, ideally, you don't keep items on exhibits for a long period of time, but I know you know, some people six months, you know, you put up an exhibit, they take a lot of work, a lot of effort, and you want to kind of get your bang for your buck. So they might stay up a while. But you know, even like if you had an exhibit and you wanted it to be up for six months, you know, maybe on a weekend or a day that you're not going to have any visitors, maybe go into those cases and close those books for, you know, a couple of days just to give them a little break. So they can kind of re reassess into their natural state might be an option. All right, Deborah, I have my own question, but I bet it uh, there there are a lot of people in or in this meeting who might can relate to it, which is. Um, as someone who manages a collection uh, who's not a trained conservator and has an extremely limited budget for conservation, what, what, what are the, are there some rules of thumb about what is, uh, what are um, steps that we can take at our institution versus how do we know when something really is a red flag that we should bring in a, cons a conservative, a trained conservator for. Yeah, that, that, that goes back a little bit to what I was talking about uh, prioritizing. You know, if you have small collections and it's, it's I think it's really important to, to look at, you know, some of the really key, what you might call key players within that collection. You know, if you've got a special book that was written by the person, you know, like a manuscript book that was written by the person who lived in your house or a book that's got special notations in it or something that's being used a lot and that is in need of repair, maybe that's something that you take and have a professional look at it. Um, and... Yeah, because because looking at smaller collections, you know, it's really you can do a lot with a little. Um, we've given workshops here for small libraries um, and really looking at at being budget minded. Um, I think there are a lot of tips like on our simple book repair manual online through Dartmouth that might give some you know additional information for smaller collections. And you know, simple things like if. You know, if you have a book that's got like a lot of red rot, again, you could go back to putting a dust jacket on it. You know, that's not taking care of the problem, but it's inhibiting that book from getting, you know, dirt on your hands or transferring it to other books in the collection. 
Um, but really like so, things like just keeping your collections clean, making sure it's, it's as dust free as possible, keeping air circulation when you can so that you don't get moisture buildup, which attracts insects and mold. Um, just like really good house cleaning goes such a long way, especially in these smaller collections. You know, I went to a collection um, and they, it, it was, yeah, they had had a silverfish outbreak because it was kind of moldy and you could, you know, see some of the damage on the book. So they, you know, had to take everything off the shelves and refresh and just kind of clean everything down. So it's always good to be a little proactive rather than taking more of the time to be a reactive. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question, but to me, it does come down to priority and where you want to put those financial resources into those one or two really unique items that you want to highlight and keep. Thanks, Deborah. That was helpful. All right, do we have any other questions? Yeah, and I just want to put out there if anybody's in the area, you know, people have asked questions, we're in Vermont. Um, we are always open if you're in, in nearby campus. Uh, love to show you around the lab and have you come in for a tour. Um, we are also here to help people um, with questions. I think that's one of the great things about the CCCA. Um, I think they've been doing a great job with outreach and really helping people do best by their um, valued materials. Uh, you mentioned, um, I have one question I didn't even think about before, but the, uh, the covers of these old journals and the red rot that uh, I think is Gaylord sells a treatment for supposedly coating them and putting on them. Um, yeah, the, it's, they, it's a Clusal G and there's another one like Salugel. Yeah. Yeah, I like to me. Um, to be honest, I do use those products, okay. um, but again, it's using it with caution. It does change the the nature of the leather. You know, it's okay. essentially I I uh, make the analogy that's similar to putting like polyurethane on your floors. It it essentially seals it up but it does change the nature. Um, yeah. And sometimes I feel like that's more beneficial than dealing with the red rot. You know, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's sort of acceptable compromise. You're compromising the nature of the material, but you're benefiting because then you can actually handle it without getting red rot everywhere. I think it's um, back to prioritizing what's more important. You know, right the, and with the original with the, or yeah you know. right because it does make it feel different um yeah. and it will darken it will darken the leather yeah you know if you were to go with one of those products you always just want to do a little test spot see how it looks um okay now part of that for me is functionality versus um not functioning or being problematic yeah. to use yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we have a comment that's come in from Rachel in the chat. She says, we made Tyvek book covers for red rotted bound mm -hmm. manuscript volumes when I worked at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania to keep researchers and the space clean without impacting the leather. Yeah, that's a great idea. Tie back or like what I mentioned before, the mylar. You know, again, if you're concerned with the display and how they look on the shelf, a mylar dust jacket might be something. But yeah, tie back, tie back would also be an option. Hey, Deborah, just to follow up. 
um, yeah. what what thickness of mylar do you like? Because one reason we went with the Tyvek is that it was it was supple, it bent easily, whereas sometimes the mylar can be a little hard to wrangle. But we might have just had really stiff stuff. Yeah, we I tend to use the three mil mylar. Okay. Yeah. Because it's you. not super thin and flimsy and it holds it, it holds a crease nicely. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, right. If you got up to the four or five, it'd be pretty thick. But I know like some of the dust jackets that you buy commercially are a lot thinner. Thinner than three? Yeah, I think they're they they can be thin. I mean, there's there are different like the ones that public libraries use, I think are thinner. Mm. I don't know, I'd have to look at the specs on commercially produced dust jackets. I have a, a clarifying question, which is um, my understanding that was that mylar is now commercially referred to as melanex. Is that the mm. same? product and, and am i am i getting that right yeah i think that is correct yes okay so if we're out there hunting for this product we're going to want to search for melanex i believe so i think there was distinction i mean i just always call it inert polyester mylar so it's it's a mylar that's manufactured not to off gas and i think again i'm i'm not going to stand by 100%, but I do believe, yeah, Melanex might be the product that is it, it that it is that it's a non off gassing polyester. What? Yeah. But if you do, if you go and you're buying from like Gaylord Archival or from an archival company, um, usually all of the specs from the products that they sell will be listed under that item. I mean, companies have gotten really good with you know, standing by their product. In art, non gasting polyester. I'm sorry, I didn't get uh, on right away. And so I'm not sure, are these uh, are Deborah's uh, post? postings available for us to go back and go through? Oh, if, well, if you want, like I can send um, like a Word document to Erica. I don't, I don't know who like knows who's, how people signed up, but I'm happy to disseminate any information. I can send a Word document that could be distributed out to the websites I mentioned in the talk. Um, happy to share anything that I, Okay, up. I just didn't know whether they were available. It seemed to go through a lot of the things quickly and wanted to be able to go back to one or two questions. So, Deborah, if you send me a PDF, I can send that out when I send the link to the recording when I oh, follow okay. up with everyone. That'd oh. be great. Great. So I just I'll just send you the resource page. Well, if either that or the PDF, you're, you can just um, save your entire presentation as a PDF, if you're okay with sharing all of your slides. And I think sure. that will allow the links to be clickable. I'm looking at Erica to see if she nods her head. Yes. yes. Oh, good. <laughs> sure. Okay. So send you a PDF of the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. Great. Power Thank you. Right. Yeah. You got there, Jean. You did. Thank you. <laughs> I don't mean to monopolize the question, but I have another, uh, the conversation, but I have another question, which is uh, taking us in the direction of mold. Oh. <laughs> and um, so I imagine that many of us are, are, are in, in situations where we at least have a little bit of mold present in our collection. And so, um, as you mentioned in your, during your talk, you know, I'm, I'm always conscious about the health risks of that for myself and, and my patrons coming into, you know, to, to use the collection. But I guess my question is about um, 
the items themselves and what steps we can take to re remediate that small bit of mold that we might see like inside a front cover of a volume and whether it's worth it to do that for us to do that in house or what where's the line between doing that in house and sending it out. All right. Well, weren't, weren't you just going to, weren't you giving a mold workshop or maybe that was Rachel <laughs> giving a workshop on that. But I just say, yeah, if you have a one off, you've got a book or maybe, you know, you found a book at home. I mean, essentially what I do is um, take a little bit of alcohol and, you know, if it's a little spot and I, and I wipe it off. Um, you can also use those sponges. Um, Ideally, you know, if the mold is, is inactive, so it's dry, um, you know, just sort of you're, you're sanitizing the area a little bit with Lysol or, or not Lysol, I'm sorry, with alcohol and just okay. getting those spores off. It's, if it's active, it, you know, it can get a little bit more messy. Uh, and I've always, you know, my take on it is the, the mold will always be there. And if you, if you create an atmosphere where it likes to grow, it will come back. Um, so I go back to the environment and really trying to keep things clean, dry and cool. Um, but yeah, we get like little wet spots up in the collections and, and find little small areas where maybe five books have gotten, you know, some mold on them. And if it's not that bad, I'll, I will just wipe them down, swab them with, with alcohol, you know, and if it's within your small collection, you, it's easier for you to keep an eye on it. You know, go back and just check, you know. Um, Rubbing alcohol? Yeah, if that's kind of what you have, um, it, it can work, sure. I didn't really spell that. But again, if it's like on the covers, you know, alcohol, if, if you know, uh, can also make things bleed, you know, if you, especially with like red, red and blues, cough covers, you know, you could, but again, it's a trade-off. You're getting rid of the mold, but you might cause some bleeding. So it's, again, it's that balance of, um, where you sit on that fence. If I could jump in on the topic of mold, uh, the Vermont Historical Records Program got funding to get a Nilfisk multi-speed HEPA filtered vacuum um, for cleaning collection storage spaces, but also to help clean collections materials and specifically to do some mold remediation to remove mold from materials. So yeah, I'm, um, I was supposed to, it was supposed to happen today, but it's, it's weather dependent because we want to do this work outside. So I'm going to the Rutland Historical Society probably two weeks from now, depending on the weather, um, to, to, to work with some moldy volumes that they've found in their collections. So I just want to make the pitch that if you do find materials that are moldy, um, please reach out um, and I'll put my email in the chat or you can get to me through the triple C A email that you all now know. Um, and I'd be happy to work out an arrangement where um, the Nilfisk and myself or my colleague Sally can um, can travel to you and train right. you how to yeah. how to remediate <laughs> how to re remediate mold um, safely and uh, for you and for your materials, um, and we can set up a time. Yeah, and it's 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 definitely something to keep tabs on. Um, yeah, ex yeah. I've I, I, like I mentioned I. Living here in the Northeast, I, I kind of kind of come across it more often than I want to. So we have a follow-up question from Deb in the chat. Has anyone used the product Shockwave for a mold remediation project? I I, I have not heard of that. It was um, part, I, I worked for a library in the mid, I mean, outside of Boston right now, but I worked for a library in the Midwest, um, which was mold, I mean, actually humidity central and then became a, a mold issue in our stacks. And it was a hazmat suit, uh, some product called shockwave applied to every single, you know, they were trying to not just handle the small outbreak, but the bloom sort of worked its way up and down the stacks. Um, and I just didn't know if it was something that was available on a, 
what would you call almost like a consumer basis and not something enormous that you purchased you know commercially um and applied but um but that was a few years ago and i wasn't i wasn't even sure i had the name right but it just suddenly came back to me but if it's not sounding familiar it doesn't sound like it's meant for a a small small uh use short use yeah i'm not familiar with that Deborah, we have another question that's come in about storing old survey maps. This person is looking for some 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 uh, storage tips. And right, and how big are they? You know, <laughs> again, size is always an issue. Ideally, you want to store them flat, but then if you don't have the space, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you can buy large sheets of acid free, like 10 or 20 point material and make big folders. What um, Deb, yeah. I'm a town clerk here in Worcester, Vermont, and we have maps that are pretty good in size. And so it's, we don't have the vault room to store them flat. So they're currently rolled up and yeah. on in stacks or in a box straight up and down. Some of these maps are, you know, 1700s. Yeah. Um, so what do you suggest? Um, yeah, there's a couple map storage solutions. Again, you know, um, resources, monetary resources are always an issue. Um, you know, you, yeah, so it sounds like you don't have an option to store them flat. So, you know, you could, you know, you want to get them into a more alkaline environment if possible. You know, you could buy, um, you know, larger sheets of acid free paper and maybe group a few maps together, like two or three maps, interleave them with the paper and then roll them up. And that way you're not rolling up like individual maps. But again, I don't know like how you use them. Like again, that makes a uh, access point a little bit trickier to have more rolled up. But in essence, we it's, have, saving, it's saving you more space. Right. We have two sets of maps. We have maps that are we keep for historical reasons that we have to keep forever, mm -hmm. and then we have maps that are used. We have some that are on mylar, have been transposed onto mylar. We recently just had a really interesting issue with them, though the ink that was used failed and so you would take out the mylar and the ink would literally fall off the page into the sleeve whoopsie big whoopsie so <laughs> i mean to replace these to have them resurveyed i mean we're talking five thousand dollars so were these maps. were those hand those were hand-drawn maps um i don't believe so but maybe the, the paper ones definitely right um the mylars i believe um no, I believe they probably were by the surveyors. Right. So the ones that were, so they were put into my R sleeves. Yes. Right. Yes. So if they were hand drawn that, you know, whatever ink that was, is, was then was friable and came off. You, you so know, this is 40 years later and the ink is failing. Right. Um, yeah, you've got a, a lot of um, issues going on there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, you know, ideally, again, you if you have tubes, you know, if you roll up maps and they get tight, it's going to be harder to unroll them. Right. And so what we've done here, we've, we've also gone through a large map collection. You can just get any type of tube. You can go to Home Depot and they have these like very large, I can't remember what they use them for, but they're not good. Um, You know, they're not conservationally sound tubes, but you want the widest tubes that you can afford space wise. And, you know, take that tube and wrap it in some mylar. So essentially you're, you're sealing the tube off and then you can put your maps around that. Um, you know, again, it. if you've got two or three maps that you can roll together, interleave them with some acid free paper just to try to create a more um, alkaline environment. But it, 
and and those would be for the like for printed maps. If you've got hand drawn maps, again, it sounds like you've got ink um, issues. So oh, I'm just gonna got another question. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess she got interrupted. Are you, you suggesting if they're flat that you put mylar between them or that? No, not necessarily, no. But ideally just storing maps flat is the best way to go. But they don't need, uh, if they're flat, they don't need a protection on them? Well, yeah, you could put, um, if you have, like I would mention, like um, like a you know acid-free board um, or like a large folder. I mentioned the company uh, Gaylord Archival. Ah, they okay. sell what's called map folders. So they're a little bit pricey, but essentially they're large folders made out of an acid-free material, which are really just nice to store your maps or any any flat object. If you have posters or broadsides, um, ideally flat is the best way to go. So yeah, you should put them in between something because that will protect. It's essentially you're creating a cover for your. Right. I, I mean, I have a, a, a number of uh, that are sort of hand drawn blueprints for how they were doing the uh, reconstruction on the building in 1948. And they've been always round, rolled up in a tube. Mm -hmm. Should I try to flatten them and put something between them to store them for? I mean, there's something that are not looked at more than three or four times a year by different people. Oh, that's that's a lot compared to some rare book <laughs> statistics. Well, this um, is the maps. That'd be a high use item. <laughs> um, yeah, I, ideally, also... if if you're taking them out and looking at them, you know, if you could unroll them and and you have storage to keep them flat, sure, that would be the best way to go. Mm -mm. And we do we do have some old maps at the historical society. I'm not at the moment. I think they have them in between some kind of mylar, mylar. Mm -hmm. things and hung. Okay. On a rack or something. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I'm not. I haven't been dealing with that. Somebody else has so. And yeah, essentially, are, course, yeah if, if I, oh, go ahead. Those are looked at more often and handled, you know, the maps. Mm -hmm. And we, we've actually made copies for, you know, people who were interested in, in the ones that are newer, but we have framed a couple that are older from the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And that might be a way to go for your blueprints. Maybe you have some copies made. Right. Well, actually, I did have a, a student three, five years ago that made copies for something he was doing on research on the end. But there are different, I don't know what material that, I mean, whether the paper is acid free or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, a follow up uh, comment in that's been someone has put in the chat um, for the custodians of these collections it would probably be worthwhile to have a collections based cap survey to help with planning for preservation of valuable materials yeah that's a great suggestion yeah Right. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I, you know, there are lots of resources out there for small institutions to get small grants um, through different venues. 
I'm not an expert on that, but I know that they are out there. Yeah, when you have a small institution that has only voluntary board and <laughs> not a lot of people, but concern about conservating. We, we have a very small two-room museum on the front of the building that had been given to the Historical Society. And um, the same exhibit has been in one of the rooms for the museum. So obviously if somebody comes to see them, they don't come back you know, for yeah. change. So if we develop a program for changing the exhibits, we have to have a way of educating our volunteers about how to do these things, so. It's a lot of work. So right. if I, uh, can I, if I could chime in for a second, can you guys hear me? My, yes. name, is, my name is Deborah LaCamera and I am a conservator down in the Boston area. And I just wanted to make everybody aware of the CAP program because it is um, uh, run through the American uh, Institute for Conservation and IMLS and, um, the application um, schedule is basically submission for the fall for review, and they offer essentially free conservation services. Uh, so they offer a, what it comes down to is a two-day conservation assessment by a CAP survey um, uh, conservator in your area. Um, if you apply and are approved and you, you know, you are granted the money, um, it's equivalent to $4,000 that's paid for by the American Institute for Conservation. So it does take um, effort on the part of your institution to uh, submit your application through um, AIC, but um, there's very little financial um, uh you know, requirement on your part, it's mostly time. And it's a very good, so the idea of it is that it's a very um, holistic approach or a holistic survey of your facilities and your collections so that you can help, that so that the conservator can help you set priorities um, and plan for the future and for the preservation of your collection. So it's, it's the idea is it's a starting point. And um, so if you look up it up at the American Institute for Conservation website, um, you'll see um, the, the application. All right. So, Thank yeah, you, Deborah. Thanks. Yeah. And I, can, I forget, what is, does that st it stands for CAP? What is it? Is it Conservation Assessment Program or? Looking it up. Yes. Yeah, so conservation no, Assessment. Collections Assessment oh, for Preservation. Collections Great. Yes. Thank you so much. That's perfect information. So culture, what is it? Culturalheritage.org is the new AIC website um, um, web address. I know so, it can be tricky because you know there's lots of funding and grants, but like how do you get to it? So this has been, that's super helpful. Absolutely. It's a good first step. Oh, okay. Do we have any other questions? Cultural, cultural heritage resources. All right. Well, I uh, would like to again thank Deborah so much for uh, presenting this webinar for us this afternoon. This has been extremely helpful. And also to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, as a reminder, we are recording this session and we will be sending out the recording to everyone who has registered in the next few days, along with uh, the resources that Deborah has put together in PDF form. And I also want you to invite you again to uh, go to the CCCA website and to consider becoming a member if you're not already. So right. Thank you so much to everybody. Yeah. And like I said, feel free to stop by, give your tour, say hi. And uh, yeah, thank you all for what coming. What building are you in? Uh, Baker Berry Library, the main oh, library. Mm, okay. All right. Good to see everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you.